African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So, so it is Saturday, um, it's Sunday, March 19th, 2023, and we are live. And hold on, we got uh, I got some of those playing here. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Sunday, March 19th, 2023. And it's a, another St. Patrick's Day time of the year, another St. Patrick's Day weekend. And I usually do a uh, presentation dealing with the history of St. Patrick's Day and understanding what it is that people are participating in. And so we're going to deal with today, uh, should African-Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Do you know what you are celebrating? Should African-Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Do you know what you are celebrating? Okay. Now, I'm not telling people they should not celebrate St. Patrick's Day if you're African-American. But if you do choose to participate, you, uh, I think you should at least know what it is that you are participating in. And, you know, when we were kids, uh, when we were children, we were taught to wear green on St. Patrick's Day. We were taught to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. And even as adults, when you ask people, especially African-Americans, what it is that they're participating in, who was St. Patrick? You ask them things like that. Uh, you know, most of them beyond him being a saint, they can't tell you who St. Patrick was. Some people say, oh, he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Um, but there's no evidence that there were ever snakes in Ireland because Ireland is an island and it's a very cold climate. It's not a climate conducive to Native Americans. I mean, it's not a climate conducive to uh, snakes. So March 17th, 2023, better known as St. Patrick's Day, you know, around this time of the year, uh, we'll see St. Patrick's Day parades, Kiss Me, I'm Iris t-shirts, green beer, et cetera. We'll see all types of parties, people getting drunk, things of this nature. Now, it's expected somewhere around 130 million, 139 million or so uh, people will spend approximately $6.9 billion on St. Patrick uh, Day related items. And this is coming from the National Retail Federation. One of the, uh, which is NRF.org, uh, NRF, uh, NRF.com. Now, one of the strangest things that you will see is African-Americans participating in this celebration. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves the question, do we really know what we're celebrating? Have you ever studied the history of St. Patrick's Day? Have you studied St. Patrick? One of the crazy things that you'll find out uh, uh, about Patrick is that Patrick was not Irish. He was actually British. Okay. And then, you know, we'll see post of, you know, African-Americans celebrating St. Patrick's Day. And they'll say things like, you know, I'm 7% Irish. I'm 10% Irish, what have you. And, you know, to echo Tina Turner, you know, like what's love got to do with it? I mean, what, what does that have to do with anything? Do you understand what you're participating in? And I post on our, our, our uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. And I usually post post this each year. But uh, I post the question, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? If you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day, which is March 25th? Um, commemorating the uh, organization of um, uh, African unity, uh, March 25th, 1963. Okay. So we've been taught to celebrate a lot of these European holidays, but we don't know why we celebrate these things. And it comes from the programming. Okay. And being stripped of African history, culture, language, spiritual systems, folklore, mores, and having uh, European culture superimposed uh, upon us. All right. So here's um, here's the uh, post that I did 
um well this is on my personal page i can't find it on our, our regular page uh our fan page but here's my post here that i did um on uh, march 17th i do it each year to ask the question if you wear green on saint patrick's day will you wear red black and green on african liberation day and i asked the question if not why not if not why not so we're going to discuss that uh on today's edition of the after history network show then also i will be live tonight for my regular show uh which is sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time the african history network show on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf 2 30 p.m eastern standard time today i'll be teaching uh, uh class number four of my online history class um black resistance movements from the haitian revolution to the uh u.s civil war civil rights movement black power movement okay so i'll be teaching uh class number four of that today and we'll give you information uh about that as well okay and that we have that on the home page of our website uh the african history network.com the african history network.com and i had it up here uh i don't know where my website page went to yeah so we have this information right here and I'll show it to you quickly. So class number four is today, and we do those sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Okay, so uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com uh, for more information. All right, so let's get into uh, this discussion here. Now, I recommend that people... Uh, read the books african people and european holidays and mental genocide by uh dr shaka musa barashango okay and uh, i'll pull up a picture here uh of the book as well these two these uh two books here uh there's a book one and a book two and the book one has a yellow cover and the book two has a purple cover all right and so when i was going through studying the history of these european holidays these are two books that i read this is this is uh book one this is book two now i got these back in 2010 so uh the the way the covers look today may be um entirely different all right i i, I don't know but in these uh books he deals with the history of these european holidays so we can better understand what it is that we are participating in all right so i highly recommend these and once again i'm not telling uh, african americans don't celebrate saint patrick's day i'm saying we should at least understand the history of what it is that um we are participating in all right now if we look quickly here at the um uh, information from the national retail federation okay uh nrf uh was it nrf.org NR, nrf.com okay dealing with saint patrick's day and this is saint patrick's day uh 2023 so the national retail federation estimates that uh more more consumers than ever are celebrating St. Patrick's Day in 2023. 61% plan to celebrate and they are expected to spend on average $43.84, uh, $43.84, okay? So it's estimated that uh, about $6.9 billion will be spent uh, on St. Patrick's Day. And it's approximately about 130 million, 140 million people. So you can check out this information at uh, the National Retail Federation, NRF.com. For historical information on Patrick, um, there's an article that I like to cite. And we're going to look at a number of different articles here. But this one is from um, History.com, the official website of the History Channel. And it deals with who was St. Patrick? Who was St. Patrick? He wasn't Irish, but he found his faith while being held as prisoner uh, by a group of Irish raiders. 
So one of the things that you'll find out about Patrick is that he was British. He wasn't Irish. Number one. Number two, you know, we're taught to wear green on St. Patrick's Day. Um, well, green wasn't even Patrick's color. Patrick's color was blue. So also a lot of what we think we know about St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day is false. All right. Uh, OK, so let's look at this here. OK, so St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland, and he's one of uh, Christianity's most widely known figures. Uh, but for all of his prevalence in culture, but for all of his prevalence in culture, namely the holiday held on the on the day of his death. So he died March 17th, uh, 461 A.D. All right. So uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day is his uh, feast day, but that commemorates the day that he died. OK, and he lived during the fifth century uh, common era A.D. But for all of his prevalence in culture, namely the holiday held on the day of his death that bears his name, his life remains somewhat of a mystery. His life remains somewhat of a mystery. Many of the stories traditionally associated with St. Patrick, including the famous account of his banishing all snakes uh, from Ireland, are false. OK, many of these stories traditionally associated with St. Patrick, including the famous account of his banishing all of the, of the snakes from Ireland, are false. The products of years of exaggerated storytelling. And once again, there's no evidence that there were ever snakes in Ireland in the first place. We're going to talk about this because this deals with the Druids, OK? who were practicing a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt and the Nile Valley region of Africa. OK, that's what that deals with. That's a metaphor. All right. So. One of the first things that you study in this history, uh, as I said, is that Patrick uh, was not Irish. OK, he was he was actually British. Um, Patrick was born in Britain, not Ireland, to wealthy parents near the end of the uh, 4th century A.D. Now, at this time, Ireland was uh, under control of the Roman Empire. OK, this is before England becomes about uh, comes about before England becomes a country or a nation or anything like that. OK, so you have the Roman Empire. Um, that is dominant at this time. So uh, Patrick was born in, in uh, Britain, not Ireland, to wealthy parents near the to wealthy parents near the end of the fourth uh, century AD. He is believed to have died uh, on March 17th uh, around 460 or 461 uh, AD common era. Although his father was a Christian deacon, um, it has been suggested that he probably took on the role because of tax incentives. And there is no evidence that Patrick came from a particularly religious family. There's no evidence that he came from a particularly uh, religious family. Now, at age 16, Patrick was taken prisoner by a group of Irish raiders who were attacking his family's estate. They transported him to Ireland where he spent six years in captivity. Okay, so he, he was a slave there in Ireland for six years. There is some dispute over where this captivity took place. Although many believe he was taken to live in Mount Slimish uh, in, in, uh, in County Antrim, A-N-T-R-I-M, it is more likely that he was held in County uh, Mayo near Kalala, K-I-L-L-A-L-A. -L -L -A. During this time, he worked as a shepherd outdoors and away from people. Lonely and afraid, he turned to his uh, religion for solace, becoming a devout Christian. It is also believed that Patrick first began, um, it is also believed that Patrick uh, first began 
uh, first began to dream of converting the Irish to uh, the Irish people to Christianity during his captivity. Now, Patrick had visions uh, as well. After more than six years as a prisoner, Patrick is going to es escape. This British slave named Patrick, who was a slave to the Irish, is going to escape. According to his writing, a voice which he believed to be the voice of God spoke to him in a dream, telling him it was time to leave Ireland. Okay, now most of what we know about Patrick comes from uh, a book that he wrote during his uh, last year's living called Confessio, Confessio. So to uh, leave Ireland, Patrick walked nearly 200 miles from County Mayo, where it is believed he was held, and he walked to the Irish coast. After escaping to Britain, which is under control of the Romans, Patrick reported that he experienced a second revelation. He said an angel um, in, the, in his dreams, an angel in a dream tells him to return to Ireland as a missionary. Soon after, Patrick began religious training as a, uh, as a course of study that lasted more than 15 years. After his ordination as a priest, uh, he was sent to Ireland with a dual mission to minister to Christians already living in Ireland and to begin to convert the Irish. So, so he was sent there in 461 um, AD. I'm sorry, he was sent there in 432 AD by Pope Celestine the first, the first to uh, uh, convert the Irish to Christianity. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Patrick incorporated Irish culture into Christian lessons. Familiar with uh, the Irish language and culture. Familiar with the Irish language and culture. Patrick chose to incorporate uh, traditional ritual into his lessons of Christianity instead of attempting uh, to eradicate native Irish beliefs. We're going to see this also happen when we study the history of Christmas as well. We're going to see what are called uh, uh, pagan rituals incorporated into the celebration of Christianity as, uh, also, okay? And there's a deep um, history behind all of this. Now, familiar, familiar with the Irish, Irish language and culture, Patrick chose to incorporate traditional ritual into his lessons of Christianity instead of attempting to eradicate uh, native Irish beliefs. For instance, he used bonfires to celebrate Easter since the Irish were used to honoring their gods with fire. He also superimposed a sun, S-U-N, a sun, which was a powerful Irish symbol, onto the Christian cross to create what is now called the Celtic cross, the Celtic cross, so that veneration of the symbol would seem more natural to the Irish. So when you're conquering people, historically, one of, one of the ways that makes it easier to conquer people is to incorporate practices, symbols that they were already worshiping into what you want to indoctrinate them with to make the transition easier, okay? As opposed to just totally wiping out what they were practicing and forcing something else onto them. It makes it easier when you incorporate some of their practices into what you were doing and we all we we see that with with um the celebration of Christmas as well. We'll come to that in just a minute here. Now, some of this is some of these practices oftentimes are referred to pagan beliefs, okay? So we have to ask the question then uh what is pagan? What is pagan? 
And pagan is a term that is uh, oftentimes used, but the original meaning of the term, a lot of people don't know. And because of European archaeology, um, anthropology, things like this, pagan has taken on to have a negative kind of connotation. But in its original sense, pagan is not something uh, that is negative. So I want to go to uh, this slide here. And this is from uh, the Saturday class that I teach. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Let me see. We have the, um, there's a slide on pagan. And also in the presentation I do dealing with uh, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice, and the history of Christmas, which is a three hour lecture that I do. Um, I talk about that there as well. And we're going to go to, let's see, what is pagan? Um, Where's that slide? Just bear with me because I'm uh, still transferring over things from the old laptop to the new laptop. Okay. All right, so let's look at this here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. And then uh, I'm going to post the information here dealing with the uh, online history class that I'm teaching uh, today at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution to the U.S. Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement. So this is a 12-week online course that I teach. And we look at history from uh, 1800 to 1968 to understand what led up to the Civil War taking place, what happened to us after slavery ended, uh, and understand the laws and policies put in place to put us where we are today to understand where we need to go from here. So I just posted the link there uh, here on the thread of the broadcast, and it's at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, so what is pagan? Um, Pagan is a word that is misused to speak negatively about a group of people. We look at American Heritage Dictionary, or you can look at Webster or uh, uh, whatever uh, dictionary you want to look at. When it's used as a noun, it's referring to an adherent of a polytheistic uh, religion in antiquity especially when viewed in contrast to an adherent of a monotheistic um, a religion, okay? Now, it has an offensive negative connotation, but when you look at the etymology of the word pagan, it goes back to uh, the Latin, um, which basically, the, the Latin paganus, which basically refers to a country dweller or a civilian from the uh, Latin word pagus, which means country or rural district. So basically, pagan in its original sense just referred to something that was indigenous to a group of people, or it could, re be re it could refer to the people who we would call country dwellers, or like today, we may refer to some people who live in the country or in the backwoods, we may refer to them as backwards or something like that, okay? But this is what pagan really means in this original sense all right now let's continue let me go back to the article from um history.com all right so patrick also superimposed the sun which is a powerful symbol uh, a powerful iris symbol onto the Christian cross to create what is now called a Celtic cross so that veneration or worship of the symbol uh, would seem more natural to the Irish. Although there were a small number of Christians on the island of Ireland when Patrick arrived in 432 AD, 
most Irish practice a nature-based, what they call pagan religion, okay? Most Irish practice a nature-based pagan religion because this is what the Druids were practicing. And we're going to come to the Druids here in just a minute because they were dealing with the watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And what they were practicing conflicted with what the European Christian church or the Eastern Orthodox church was, was teaching and what they were trying to force onto the Irish. Now the Irish culture centered around a rich tradition of oral legend and myth. When this is considered, it is no surprise that the story of Patrick's life became exaggerated, became exaggerated over the centuries, spinning exciting tales to remember. History has always been a part of the Irish way of life. Spinning exciting tales to remember history has always been a part of the of the Irish way of life. Okay, now also, Patrick was never canonized as a saint. St. Patrick was never canonized as a saint. So once again, most of what we think we know about St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day is false. He may be known as the patron saint of Ireland, but Patrick was never actually canonized by the Catholic Church. This is simply due to the era he lived in. During the first millennium, there was no formal canonization process in the Catholic Church. After becoming a priest and helping to spread Christianity through Ireland, Patrick was likely proclaimed a saint by popular acclaim. Okay, now um, let's look at what is a patron saint, okay? What is a patron saint? Because Patrick is the patron saint to Ireland, but what is a patron saint? Okay, let me go to let me go. Uh, let me go to the slide here. We'll go to patron saint in just a minute. Let me go to this other piece here because it mentioned Easter a couple minutes ago, and uh, Patrick. Uh, teaching about Easter as well. Okay. So uh, when we look at pagan and the race relationship to between pagan and Easter, 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 Oystra. Like many other Christian feasts, the celebration at Easter contains a number of original pagan or, or folk religious elements tolerated by the Christian church. Among these are customs associated with the Easter egg, Easter breads, and other special holiday foods. And the European concept of the Easter hare or Easter rabbit or Easter bunny OK, uh, Easter uh, uh, in America, the Easter rabbit, which brings baskets of candies and colored eggs during the night. The pagan roots of Easter involve the spring festivals of pre-Christian Europe and the Near East, which celebrates the rebirth of vegetation, welcoming the growing light as the sun be becomes more powerful in its course towards summer. It is significant that in England and Germany, the church accepted the name of the pagan goddess Easter, which is Anglo-Saxon or, e uh, or Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-A. Her name has several spellings for this new Christian holiday. So that come, that's named after a, a goddess worshiped in different um European cultures, Anglo-Saxon and other different European cultures. This is where the word Easter actually comes from. And Easter is celebrated uh, on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox occurs on March 20th 
on March 21st, usually March 20th, March 21st. Okay. Uh, and in marks um, the first day of spring, and it's the day where you have the same amount of daylight as sunlight. It, this is all based upon astronomy. In Mediterranean Europe, Italy, Spain, and France, Christianity adopted Pascha, P A S C H A, a word derivative of Passover, from which comes the adjective Paschal, P A S C H A L, for things pertaining to Easter, such as the Paschal lamb. Okay, so that's some. So we see how, with the celebration of Easter, we see um, what Europeans refer to as pagan traditions incorporated into the uh, celebration of Easter. We see the same thing with the celebration of Christmas. Okay, now I may say some things that are outside the circumference. Of your own awareness, I probably, I probably already have. I, I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness. So let me do my disclaimer now. Just because you may disagree with it or never heard it before or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you may have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens, and uh, I usually have people. So when I speak about controversial topics or especially when I speak to um, uh, groups that are uh, various races, I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. And I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside of the circumference of my own awareness. Okay. So this is what we're talking about. So Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. And um, they're going to have to recalculate when to celebrate Easter because, um, and this is one of the reasons why the Gregorian calendar was introduced in uh, 1582 uh, by Pope Gregory the 13th, because the Gregorian calendar, which is the calendar that we use today, it's based upon how long it takes the, uh, the, the, the earth to rotate around the sun, um, counterclockwise. Okay. It takes 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes, and approximately, uh, 46 seconds. So prior to that, they were using the uh, Julian calendar, named after Julius Caesar. And when they were celebrating Easter, kept getting further and further away from the vernal from the vernal equinox, which and, and vernal is Latin for spring, S P R I N G. Vernal is Latin for spring. So they were celebrating um, Easter further and further away from the vernal equinox. So coming out of the third council of Trent um, around 1581, 1582 or so, uh, coming out of the third council of Trent, they uh, cre uh, created the Gregorian calendar right about 1583. They created the Gregorian calendar, which is the calendar that we use today. All right. Now, what is a patron saint? Okay, so if we look at Britannica Concise Encyclopedia, or you could look at your encyclopedia of choice or dictionary of choice, Merriam-Webster, whatever it is. A patron saint is a saint to whose protection and intercession, some uh, a, a spirit interceding on your behalf, a saint to whose protection and intercession, a person, society, church, place, profession, or activity is dedicated. The choice is usually made on the basis of some real or presumed relationship. For example, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland because he's credited with introducing Christianity in Ireland. Okay. So when we look at patron saints, we know that um, St. Maurice is the patron saint to Germany, and St. Maurice was an African Moor, all right? Uh, St. Patrick is the patron saint to Ireland. St. Nicholas 
um, who who was a real person lived in uh, modern day Turkey around um, third or fourth century AD. And the uh, center class amongst the Dutch, that religious figure center class amongst the Dutch is based upon St. Nicholas. And from center class being brought to the uh, U.S. in the early 1700s, when you have the Dutch immigrating to the U.S., they're going to bring the they're going to bring this religious figure a center class who had a long white beard and wore a a, a red cape with an, a, a white outfit. That is going to be transformed into the secular figure of Santa Claus and Saint Nicholas is a, a, a center class is Dutch for Saint Nicholas okay so from the religious figure of center class you get the secular figure and Thomas Nast the cartoonist Thomas Nast N-A-S-T is largely credited with creating the image of what we know as Santa Claus, the jolly fat fellow with the long white beard, the red, uh, the red outfit. Okay. He is the one who's largely credited with creating that image of Santa Claus. All right. So we do, a, we do all this in, in um, the lecture I do ancient Kemet which is one of the original names for Egypt, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. Now, you may ask, well, who's the person crouched down with wearing blackface in the Afro wig? That's Joata Piet, Black Pete, who was a Moor. And the story of Joata Piet uh, comes about, about uh, the 18, I think the 1850s or so. And it was a children's story. And in one of the versions of the story, he was a Moor who becomes a slave. He was a Moor who becomes a slave of center class, okay, of uh, of center class, of St. Nicholas. And he's, uh, uh, Joie de Piet slides down the chimney. And if the children are bad, you know, he'll put coal in their stocking. Okay, Joie de Piet. So over the, uh, the the celebration, so they, they would have parades in throughout uh, the Netherlands, starting in the beginning of November throughout uh, going into December. And you have white people putting on blackface, putting on Afro wigs, dressed up as Joie de Piet, Black Pete. Over the last 10 years or so, there has been an increase in opposition to Joie de Piet. And people are saying it's racist, it's dehumanizing to African people, etc. Okay. So in November of each year, going into December, you'll probably see articles written about these protests taking, pl taking place in the Netherlands. But this also deals with the history of the Moors in Europe, because in uh, the the mythology surrounding uh, center class and Joie de Piet, center class and Joie de Piet come into the Netherlands. They say on a steam on a steamboat from Spain in the beginning of November. And you will have oftentimes the, them re, uh, those in the Netherlands reenacting this also when you when you study this history and you study the celebration. OK, let's continue. So. Some other patron saints. Are. Let me see. Go back to patron saints uh, right here. Some other patron saints. So St. Nicholas is the patron saint to Amsterdam and Russia. Um, St. Benedict the Moor is a patron saint to Palermo and San Frantello, uh, Sicily. He was also called Il Moro 
which is Italian for dark skinned. He was also referred to as the African or the black. OK, St. Benedict the Moor. So that deals with patron saints. All right. Now, let's go back to. Um, let's see here. OK, so we did the article dealing with who was St. Patrick from history.com. Now. I want to look at. Page 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Because what this does is this helps us to better understand some of this history. Um, and page 95 deals with, let's see, I think I have that broken down. Page 95 deals with um, getting a better understanding of the incorporation of different cultures into religious practices. Now, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder is one of the books that we use in um, the, my Saturday class that I teach my 12 week online course on Saturday. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we have information about that at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, now if we look at this here, and I'm going to zoom in on this. Page 95 uh, uh, deals with... The story of Osar Arset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And uh, Browder says in 1984, the, uh, at the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Charles Kofer, professor of Old Testament at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, discussed the role of Egypt and Ethiopia in the Old Testament. He stated the following, quote, in the King James and Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the word Egypt or Mitzraim in Hebrew, along with cognates occurs some 740 times. In the Old, Test in the Old Testament, the word translated Ethiopia and or Cush, C-U-S-H, Cush uh, and Cush in Hebrew, along with cognates, and including three instances of duplication in the references, appears 58 times in the King James uh, Version. And Cush is referring to a region, more so a region in ancient Africa that included um, Nubia or Tanahesi. In this version, the translation Ethiopia is used 39 times. Cush untranslated with cognates 19 times. The numerous references to Egypt led one Old Testament scholar to remark, quote, no other land is mentioned so frequently as Egypt in the Old Testament, end quote. To understand Israel, one must look well into Egypt. Now, the story, so bottom of, of this page here, page 95. The story of Asar, Aset, and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, or the Trinity. The Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia, or Ta-Nehisi, as long as 3,300 BCE or BC, be before Christ or before the common era, okay, have existed, is known to have existed in ancient Nubia as late as 3,300 BCE. Carved on the walls of the Temple of Luxor, circa 1380 BCE, around 1380 before Christ, 
are scenes which depict the following one so bottom uh my left bottom the panel we see four different scenes depicted here one the annunciation the netter de Huti, who the greeks called thoth is shown announcing to the virgin all set the coming birth of their son heru who the greeks called horus and the greeks called all set isis okay so this is the annunciation and Dahuti is telling the virgin all set that she's going to give birth to a son. Scene number two, the Immaculate Conception, the Netter Neph, K-N-E-P-H, who represents the Holy Ghost, and the Netter Het Heru, who the Greeks called Hathor, are shown symbolically impregnating all set by holding Anx, which is the symbol for eternal life coming out of ancient Kemet, the African symbol, the ancient Kemetic symbol for eternal life. They're holding Anx to the nostrils of the virgin mother to be symbolically impregnating her. This is the, immac the immaculate conception. Then the third scene is at the top, the virgin birth. All set, who the Greeks called Isis, is shown sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives. So we knew that it made more sense to sit on the birthing stool and let gravity take its course, right? So this is what we see depicted here. In the fourth scene at the bottom on my right, the adoration, the newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from the three kings or magi while being adored by a host of gods and men so we see these ele the elements from these four scenes incorporated into the christian story of the annunciation and it, it and it is the um angel uh gabriel who announces to the Virgin Mary that she's going to give birth to a son. That, and that's, that's the Annunciation. We see all that incorporated into the Christian story. If we look here at page 168 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, he shows you the Houthi, okay? And he, and we know that Many of the deities coming from uh, the Greeks and then later the Romans were influenced by the Netter, by the Netter rule or the deities coming out of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt and the Nile Valley region of Africa. So he shows you um, the Houthi, he shows you Hermes Trismegistus, and he shows you Mercury. And if we look at this, what it says is Dahuti, the netter of science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech and medicine, holds in his hands two staffs with entwined snakes, two staffs with entwined snakes. One serpent wears the crown of Upper Kemet or Upper Egypt. The other wears the crown of Lower Kemet or Lower Egypt. Dahuti was referred to as Thoth by the Greeks. OK, so he, he has two staffs. And a snake is wrapped around each staff. That's Dehuti, who has the head of an ibis. And he's the he's the netter or deity of uh, science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech. And it's Dehuti that records in the, the book or the record the results of when you die and your heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. Your heart is weighed against the essence of a woman in the judgment scene that we see depicted in uh, ancient Kemet as well, the judgment scene. Okay, now number two, you see Hermes. Okay, the deity Hermes amongst the Greeks. He was the Greek equivalent to Thoth. You also see um, Thoth uh, called, uh, you also see the Houthi called Thoth amongst the Greeks as well. But Hermes was the Greek equivalent of the Houthi. 
he is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes. It was called the Staff of Hermes. In Greek mythology, he was associated with wisdom and the hermetic sciences were named in his honor and the hermetic sciences are going to uh, be very uh, essential when it comes to Freemasonry. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So we have Dahuti with two staffs and the snake wrapped around each staff. And the Greek version of Dahuti is Hermes who carries one staff with uh, two snakes wrapped around the one staff. Then we see Mercury that is actually Roman, not Greek. We see Mercury, which is the uh, Roman version of Dahuti and Hermes. And we see Mercury in, in different, in different uh, cartoons and different things like this, different mythology. Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes and Dahuti, and he is similar in all aspects. The staff that Mercury carries is called the Caduceus. The Caduceus, and it has been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. So when we look at the American Medical Association or different, different medical associations or dental associations, we see versions of this African symbol called the Caduceus. But because we've been stripped of African history, culture, language, spiritual systems, et cetera, they can co-opt our symbolism, represent it to the world as if they created it themselves, and we don't know any different. So we look at the American, the, we look at the Arizona Latin American Medical Association. They have the caduceus with the wings of with the wings of Ra and uh the staff and the two snakes wrapped around it. We look at the Amer American Medical Association. And it has one staff with a snake wrapped around it. We look at this symbol here from uh, uh, from uh, dealing with dentistry, and it has a staff with a snake wrapped around it. Okay, but that goes back to ancient Kemet, goes back to our ancestors, which gets co-opted by Europeans. Now it goes on to say here, page uh, one hundred sixty-eight. So I was sharing what was in the margins. Let's look at the text here. Everybody follow me. Everybody all right. Everybody follow me. Are you learning anything? Let me know. Okay. All right. Now, this is the type of information we get deep into in the online history classes that I teach. So be sure to visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, I'm teaching class today at 2.30 p.m. So I got to wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> teaching a class today at 2.30 p.m. dealing with... Um, uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. OK, so that's a deep class also. So we we get to uh, really analyze a twelve hundred year period of history. All right. But this type of information I'm talking about right now, we get deep into that in uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, now. Let's look at the text of page um, 168 from Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Greco-Roman mythology, Greco-Roman mythology, just as certain architectural stylings, which originated in Kemet, greatly influenced the Greeks and Romans, the same can be said for the Nile Valley concepts of the Netaru, who are the forces of nature, the deities. Netar for singular, Netaru for plural. Of the Netaru, whom the Greeks and Romans referred to as gods, the pyramid text in Kemet, uh, about 3200 BC to 2250 BCE, uh, described a family of nine Netaru which became known as the great Ennead, the great Ennead. Uh, and Ennead is Greek, which means nine, the number nine. This term is derived from the Greek word Ennea, which means nine, N-I-N-E. 
the basic sources of Greek mythology, all of their primary characters and themes were contained in three classical works, Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which were all written in the 8th century BCE, before the Common Era or before Christ. During the 3rd century BCE, the Romans began to closely identify with divinities of Greece. Rome's classical literature of religious and moral teachings was written in the later years, the latter years, of this 1st century BCE by the poet Virgil. The great work was called the Aeneid, and it consisted of 12 books. Virgil based the six books on the Odyssey, and the last six books were modeled after the Iliad. Virgil wrote the Aeneid, A-E-N-E-I-D, to establish the divinity of the Roman Empire, which he closely associated with that of Greece. Okay, and then... Uh, it goes through and shows the relationship between different deities in ancient Kemet, the Greek version, and the Roman version. Um, all right, now, the, the, the slide I, I wanted was, um, okay, so, so yeah, that was, that was on that page. Okay. All right, now, in the Christian version of the story, of the Annunciation and Immaculate Conception, things like this. It's the it's Gabriel, the messenger angel, which delivers the Annunciation to the Virgin uh, Mary. Okay, now, I also talked about incorporating um, what Europeans call pagan traditions into the celebration of Christmas. Okay, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Okay, just because you never heard it before, or disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you, you may have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I'm dealing with something that's outside of the circumference of your own awareness. If we let me go back to slide 144. Because this, this, um, these slides are from the 12 week online course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So it's a deep course. Anybody watching us taking that course, you know, we cover a lot of information. There's probably 70, 80 articles that we reference in there. There's seven books that I use as reference also. So in 2011, I was at a CVS pharmacy um here in detroit on east jefferson in detroit and i saw this i was at the checkout stand and i saw this book called the life of christ the life of christ and i have that book here in the office somewhere uh what the hell is it? it's in one of my stacks of books here so i still have it uh, i can't remember where i put it though but the life of Christ. This is from the American Bible Society and um, Time Home Entertainment Books. And it says, rediscover how his life, death and resurrection changed the world. So. I was I had a few minutes in the checkout line before they got to me, so I said, so what are they trying to say now? So I went and picked it up and started looking through it. And I came across the information here on page 55. Now, this relates to incorporating what Europeans call pagan practices into Christian traditions to get people to adopt those traditions, practices, holidays, whatever it is. Page 55 of the 2011 edition um of the life of christ asked the question why december 25th why december 25th they're asking why is christmas celebrated on december 25th so when you read it and and this book cost 12 dollars. i bought this because of what is on page 
55, because these are things I've been saying that Dr. Ray Higgins and others, you know, have been saying, you know, Dr. Charles Finch and Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene and others, uh, Professor James Small, et cetera, Tony Browder. Even the History Channel has information on things like the, you know, this type of information, history.com. It says in Christianity's early years, people debated when Jesus' birth when Jesus' birthday should be celebrated. Some Christians were against observing it at all as they did not want Jesus or Yeshua because the letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD. And look at look at the word Jesus in the dictionary, Mary, Merriam-Webster, whatever it is. Look at the etymology of the word and it, it, it takes you back to Yeshua. It takes you back to Yeshua uh, which is Hebrew with a Y because the letter J didn't exist. The letter um, the letter J is derived from the letter I. So this is why in your six in your 26 character alphabet, the letter J comes after I. The letter J is an I with a hook on it. All right, so the uh, you see so you had some people who did not want to observe jesus birthday at all because they didn't want uh jesus compared to pharaoh and herod whose birthdays were commemorated they don't tell you which pharaoh and the subiti pharaoh in the myth in the mythology of the in the story of uh not to get too deep into this because it's a whole nother presentation but the Exodus story, and they talk about the Hebrews um, leaving out of Egypt, and they talk about Pharaoh. In the story, now in the Ten Commandments, they'll say Ramses, but in the story, in the biblical text, they usually don't tell you which Pharaoh they're referring to. Okay, that's a whole nother. Um, that's a whole nother presentation. I've done that presentation before, but there's a uh, when we deal with when we talk more about when I do my presentation on Easter, we'll get deeper into that in the historical accuracy of the Exodus. Um, because there's no evidence to prove that there's no evidence to substantiate the exodus, a mass exodus of uh of Hebrews out of um uh out of Egypt, a, a million. 500,000, something like that. It, it would have thrown off the ecology and then wandering in the desert uh, for 40 years or wherever they were supposed to wander for 40 years, it would have thrown off the total ecology of where it was they, they were supposed to have been. But there's a, there's a whole nother presentation. Uh, so in the fourth century AD, common era, Pope Julius I made it official Christ's birth would be celebrated on December 25th. Christ's birth would be celebrated on December 25th, okay? So this was um, uh, about three, was it three, uh, about 345 AD, something like that. Uh, he decrees, he, he says that Christ's birth would be celebrated on December 25th. Now, December 25th was already considered the birthday of the Son of God, the S-U-N, not the S-O-N, the S-U-N, December 25th. This, this deals with the winter solstice, which deals with astronomy. Using the technology available at the time, ancient astronomers observed that on December 25th, the day started getting longer again, okay? They recognized the date as the winter solstice, the winter solstice. When the sun is born again each year, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N. So the winter solstice occurs on December 20, 20th, December 21st, could be early in the morning, December 22nd. The Romans celebrated the birthday of the god Sol Invictus, or which means unconquered sun. Sol, the, the, the word soul is in reference to sun, Sol Invictus. And they and the Romans celebrated that birthday on December 25th. The day was also recognized as the birthday 
of the Persian deity or the Persian sun god known as Mithra. And as the birthday of Attis, an agricultural god worshipped in Asia Minor. By choosing December 25th, the church avoided upsetting the masses. No one wanted their festivals canceled. So the Christian church simply combined the new Christian holiday with pagan traditions as a way to make it easier for people to transition to what you want to indoctrinate with indoctrinate them with. So as the Roman Empire is conquering people and forcing onto them their religion, their practices, etc., they are incorporating some of the quote unquote pagan traditions that those people who are being conquered are already practicing, they are incorporating them into their religious, the Roman religious practices and celebrations, etc. Okay. So, uh, and, and that makes the, the conquering them, uh, uh, easier in the transition easier as well. All right. Now, Um, what's the winter solstice? So when we look at it astronomically, the winter solstice is the instant at which the sun reaches the point of maximum southerly southerly declination. So the the sun in its uh, voyage is journeyed throughout the twelve constellations. The sun reaches its lowest point about december 20th december 21st okay and it's in the it's in the constellation of capricorn it enters in it enters into the constellation of capricorn um and it said for three days december 20 uh december 22nd 23rd 24th it appears the sun stands still it appears the son of god the s-u-n is dead and does not move on december 25th the sun moves one degree northward and December 25th marks uh, the rebirth of the sun and uh, the sun has additional, there's additional sunlight. The, the days start getting longer. So starting on December 25th, the days begin to get longer and each subsequent day is longer and longer and longer. So December 25th was known as the rebirth of the son of God, the S-U-N, not the S-O-N, or the birth of the son of God. The instant at the winter solstice is the instant at which the sun reaches the point of southerly maximum declination on or about December 21st. A solstice, S-O-L-T-I-C-E, which occurs when the when occurs when the position of the earth is at the perihelion or when it is nearest to the sun by its north pole north pole nearest to the sun is inclined away from the sun okay um uh, it occurs there it, it occurs when there is winter in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere so if we look at the etymology of the word uh solstice comes from the latin prefix sol s-o-n meaning sun and stit uh past participle of sister and we look at the word solstitum, which means stand still. So solstice literally means sun, S-U-N, stand still. Okay, this is where this comes from. This is why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, because nowhere in the biblical text, now this may go outside the circum circ circumference of some people's awareness. Nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Yeshua or Jesus the Christ um was born on December 25th. That's based upon astronomy. All right, now, let's look at the Druids, okay? Let's look at these people called the Druids because this is who um, the British slave named Patrick encounters in 432 AD when Pope Celestine I sends him into Ireland to convert the uh, Irish to Christianity. Now, the word Druid 
in old Irish means um means he who he who knows he who knows and the druids were practicing something called the gnosis okay which means true knowledge and they get their knowledge they, they're, they're practicing a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt okay the druids so let's look at page 193 and 194 of now valley let's look at page uh 193 and 194 of now valley contributions to civilization by tony browder and i have it here and let's go to this okay i have it here in the pdf All right, so let's flip over here. Okay, this is page 193 and 194 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. And I've interviewed Browder a number of times on the African History Network show. We've been on panel discussions together as well. He's a brilliant historian and archaeologist. Okay, so this deals with the development of European secret societies, the development of European secret societies. But I want to start in the margins first because he talks about Dahuti, which we've already talked about. So he said Dahuti was known to Europeans as Hermes Trismegistus. We talked about Hermes amongst the Greeks being the Greek version of Dahuti. The Houthi was known to Europeans as Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, and Trismegistus means thrice great, three times great. He was a philosopher, priest, and king. Hermes was regarded as the god or the deity of wisdom, um, science, medicine, magic, measurement, mathematics, and he is said to have authored innumerable books on these and other subjects he is said to have authored innumerable books on these and other subjects masons or freemasons regard hermes as the author of all masonic initiatory rituals hermes is said to have been the author of 42 books which contained the wisdom of ancient kemet ancient egypt According to Manly P. Hall, quote, the Romans and later the Christians realized that until these 42 books were eliminated, until these books were eliminated, they could never bring the ancient Egyptians into subjugation. Now, books on the Hermetic sciences were said to contain information regarding the ancient Egyptians or ancient Kemetic people's understanding of immortality, which was based on the knowledge that, quote, the body is the tomb of the soul. The body is the tomb of the soul. During the Greco-Roman occupation of Egypt, the Greeks and the Romans, the Greco-Roman soldiers formed a secret body of specialized scholarship and training in the Hermetic sciences. They became known as Druids and later moved from Egypt into Greece and Rome before establishing a school in Ireland. So here we see a depiction of Hermes Trismegistus. OK, and next to Hermes is the staff with two snakes wrapped around it, what we know as the Caduceus. OK, this is where the Caduceus comes from which comes from the two staffs with a snake with one snake wrapped around each of it each staff that Dahuti carried okay so if we look at this here page 195 the development of european secret societies one of the most enduring aspects of 
uh, one of the most enduring aspects of the Nile Valley civilization was the proliferation of its scientific and philosophical thought, which became known outside of ancient Kemet as the mystery schools. Okay, as the mystery schools. And let me zoom in on this here. This became known outside of uh, ancient Kemet as the mystery schools or the hermetic sciences. From the earliest of times, the masses of Europeans were poor and ignorant, while only the most fortunate men, noblemen, lords, scribes, and various religious leaders were provided with an education. Of this group, so that may be, say, the top 10% get provided with an education, okay, in in Europe, historically in Europe, going back hundreds of years. While only the most fortunate men, noblemen, lords, scribes, and various religious leaders were provided with an education. Of this group, an even smaller number knew how to adequately read or write. So that may be the top five, maybe 5% of the European population or 4% of the European population, something like that. Of this group, an even smaller number knew how to adequately read or write. Now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. Just means you have to do more research to understand what I'm talking about, especially historical research. And world histories and world history books, religious literature is in religious literature books. You, you have to understand the difference between world history and religious literature. That's another conversation. The dogma of Christianity was readily available to the masses of people. And the masses of Europeans were poor and ignorant. While the educated elite studied the ancient teachings, which were called, which, which were also called gnosis or true knowledge. Where did those ancient teachings come from? The, the, the educated elite in Europe was studying a watered down version of the teachings coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa, coming from especially ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, coming from our ancestors, while they gave to the masses who were poor and ignorant and also illiterate, they gave them Christianity or what we would say, Euro, we would say European Christianity. So the ruling elite are studying the gnosis or the true knowledge. The newly emerging schools of hermetic, neoplatonic and Gnostic thought in Europe were loosely based on the Nile Valley principles of education, the Nile Valley region of Africa, especially ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley principles of education, which were designed to awaken within an individual knowledge of self, knowledge of self. This knowledge of self led to an awareness of the power of the creator, creatress force, who we've been taught to call God. The knowledge, the powers of God, which exist within man and woman as expressed in the myths of Asar, Aset, and Heru. This philosophy was in direct conflict with Christianity, or European Christianity. This philosophy was in direct conflict with Christianity, which taught that man was conceived in sin and that salvation could only be gained through Yeshua or Jesus the Christ, the Pope or other accepted intermediaries. One example of the clash between these opposing ideologies 
can be found by studying the symbolism incorporated into the story of St. Patrick and the Druids of Ireland. Peter Tompkins in his wonderful book, Secrets of the Great Pyramid, provided a clue to this mystery in a brief overview of the Druids. He said Druid in old Irish meant he who knows. Julius Caesar, our earliest source on the subject, considered the Druids to be highly educated and well organized. In Debello Gallico, he commented, Julius Caesar commented, it is especially the object of the, of the Druids to inculcate this, that souls do not perish. Souls do not perish. But after death pass into other bodies, and they consider that by this belief, more than anything else, men may be led to cast away the fear of death and to become courageous and to become courageous. They discuss many points concerning the heavenly bodies and their motion, the extent, so astronomy, the extent of the universe and the world, the nature of things, the influence and ability of the immortal gods, and they instruct the youth in these things. And they instruct the youth in these things. So the Druids are also teaching the youth. Okay, end quote. Now, the Druids were also known to dress in a style similar to the priestly kings of ancient Kemet. Their heads were often adorned with a uraeus, which was the symbol of the cobra that was worn on the crown of the Nesubiti or Pharaoh. Okay, the uraeus, which was the symbol of a cobra, a snake that was worn on the crown of the Pharaohs. Because of this symbolic imagery, the Druids were often referred to by outsiders as the snake people. Their presence and ideology were viewed as a direct threat to the development of Christianity in Ireland. In 432 Common Era AD, or ACE after the Common Era, 432, Pope Celestine I sent a former British slave named Patrick into the region of Ireland, which was under the control of the Roman Empire, to convert the population of the Irish and the Druids to Christianity. In the name of Christianity, Patrick's army killed thousands of Druids, of Irishmen, of Druids. And he is said to have founded more than 300 churches and baptized more than 120,000 people. Patrick also introduced the Roman alphabet and Latin literature into Ireland. He is rewarded by the Vatican with sainthood, even though he was never canonized as a saint as the article from history.com correctly stated who was St. Patrick. He was never canonized as a saint, but he is looked at as being a saint. So he was rewarded by the Vatican with sainthood. And today, millions of people throughout the world celebrate St. Patrick's Day on his feast day, March 17th, because he died March 17th is before 62 uh, AD, right around there, 462. So that's the day he died. To the average person who dresses in green, wears shamrocks, and green wasn't even Patrick's color. Patrick's color was blue, not green. To the average person who dresses in green, wears shamrocks, and marches in parades, this day commemorates the myth of a man who drove the snakes out of Ireland. What most people fail to realize is that the snakes Patrick drove into the sea were not snakes that crawled on the ground because there's no evidence of snakes ever being in Ireland, but the snake people who walked on two feet and were once known as Druids. So you're honoring a mass murderer 
who killed thousands of Druids on behalf of the Christian church. And the Druids were practicing a watered down version of the teachings that were being practiced by our ancestors coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa. And you have African-Americans participating in a mass in a, in a celebration honoring a mass murderer. So you can do that if you want to. But going back to Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango's book, African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide. It's important to understand what the hell we have been taught to celebrate because we've been indoctrinated with this. Now, you go ask the average person about St. Patrick. They can't explain any of this to you because we've never been taught to go research. We've been taught to just practice what we've been indoctrinated with so we were taught in school to wear green on saint patrick's day we're gonna come to the information green wasn't even patrick's color we were taught that patrick was irish he wasn't irish he was british we were taught that he drove the snakes out of ireland there's no evidence snakes were ever in ireland at some point we have to realize that we have to break this intergenerational slave mentality that we've been taught to have. So if you want to celebrate, a, 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 if you want to celebrate this, this Irish holiday honoring the mass murderer, I mean, if you, if you want to, but you can do it if you want to. But we should at least, as African people, understand the history behind what we're being taught to participate in, what we're being taught to celebrate. Because if you choose to continue to celebrate it, when you have more knowledge, it'll probably cause you to change how you participate in it if you choose to continue to do that. Okay, most of these European holidays I don't celebrate because I've studied the history of all of them. This is why our knowledge, at the, this is why I model the African History Network is right now is correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. This is why our history and culture were taken away from us. This is why you have uh republican governors and republican state legislatures passing laws to suppress the teaching in various ways of african-american history and and not just african-american history but to then also ban books dealing with african-american history the civil rights movement di different subject matter that they deem is inappropriate and oftentimes it is books dealing with African Americans or non white people. So you can celebrate and drink green beer and get drunk as much as you want to and wear and wear shirts that say kiss me I'm Irish. I'm not sure if you have a shirt that says kiss me I'm African. And this is why I asked the question. Every St. Patrick's Day asked the question, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear Will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? If not, why not? Do you know what you're celebrating? Do you know what we're being indoctrinated with? If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So just keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, finance our, our Sunday night show at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. Um, pay some of the bills, etc. Also, um, I'm teaching my Sunday class that I teach. And I'm teaching that today when I finish, because uh, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes because I got to jump off here and teach this class. Um, black resistance movements from the uh, Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. As this class, uh, we're teaching that today. So that's a 12 week online course that I teach. And we focus in on history from 1800 to 1968. 
and we look at the Haitian Revolution and the U.S. Civil War. I mean, Haitian Revolution and the uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803, because those two uh, events are related. Uh, we look at what leads up to the Civil War taking place. And we look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865, 1877, uh, Jim Crow Era, and we see um, a lot, we see similarities between the Jim Crow Era, uh, when states are rewriting their state constitutions and imposing poll taxes and literacy tests. We see similarities between that era and what's going on right now, when you have um, 19, at least 19 states that have passed uh, 34 voter suppression laws. And uh, then we also see the attack on public education as well. And this false attack on critical race theory um, and wokeness. And most of these Republicans can't tell you what critical race theory is or what the word or what the word woke means. But it's uh, woke is becoming the new N word. OK, and they're attacking things that are are uh, that deal with African people, our history, culture, et cetera. OK, so if we look at this here, uh, let's see, where is this? And. Trying to find okay the website right here, uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, the U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, eighteen hundred to nineteen sixty-eight. So we look at the Jim Crow era, uh, Great Migration, nineteen fifteen, nineteen seventy, six million African Americans migrating from the South up north and out west. World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement to understand what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place? to put us in a predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here. This also ties into um, reparations and legal arguments for reparations as well. So if you saw me on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture, on Thursday, March 16th, we were breaking that down. We're dealing with the San Francisco uh, Reparations Task Force and their uh, over 100 recommendations have not been adopted yet. It was recommended at a meeting. They, ha they haven't been adopted yet. And then uh, we talked about the California Reparations Task Force also. And their the 500 page study they released. Everybody needs to go read that 500 page study um, because most of what we know about reparations is wrong. As a historian, I'm telling you right now, I hear the whole bunch of nonsense just floating around. And most of what we think we know about reparations is false. And uh, we're going to deal with that on uh, my show tonight, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if we look here at, uh, let me give you the, I'll give you the link here for, so you can read the, uh, rep you can, San Francisco Reparations Task Force. I'm going to give you the link here to their, uh, the report on the website. So you can check this out. Uh California Reparations Task Force, because I've started reading the executive summary. The executive summary is 22 pages. The uh, study is the most comprehensive study dealing with African-Americans in our history since the Kerner Commission report in 1968. Uh, so if you look at this, this is at, and you can subscribe to the newsletter as well here. Uh, State of California Department of Justice. This is a reparations report, uh, June 1st, 2022. The task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans issued its interim report to the California legislature. Uh, the interim report uh, surveys the ongoing and compounding harms experienced by African Americans as a result of slavery and the lingering effects on American society. Now, they focus in on California history, but they also deal with the history of the U.S. Now, California did not have a history of slavery traditionally. Uh, California becomes a state in the Union in 1850 after the um, Mexican-American War, which ends in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And California comes into the Union as a free state. 
So they don't have a history of slavery, but they have a rampant history of voter suppression, uh, segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, job discrimination. And in 1852, they also adopted a Fugitive Slave Act and they enforced a Fugitive Slave Act as well. Now, they have identified about 1,500 people um, in the 1850s who had a semi-slave status, but traditionally uh, California under as part of the union does not have a history of slavery and san francisco does not have a history of slavery so when really when you study what the san francisco reparations task force is doing they're dealing with the legacy of slavery what happens after slavery ends because uh like i just mentioned because they don't have a history of slavery reparations is not synonymous with slavery that's one of the huge misconceptions but they have the link here to the full interim report which is 500 pages the executive summary, 22 pages, key findings and preliminary uh, recommendations. So this is at oag.ca.gov. I'm going to post the link here. Uh, so because we need to form study groups to study this information and really understand uh, what happened to us. And when we deal with repairing the damage of a legacy of 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, job discrimination, discrimination when it comes to getting bank loans, uh, discrimination with the GI Bill, et cetera. We have to understand the laws and policies that were put in place that, that inflicted the harm upon us. So we know the laws and policies that we have to get in place to repair the damage from the harm that was inflicted upon us. Just getting a cash check, just getting a check does not address the laws and policies that will still be in place after you spend the money. And it's those laws and policies that are now distributed wealth pond resources into the hands of Europeans. So cash payments can be part of an overall comprehensive reparations remedy. But just getting cash payments does not correct the damage that was done. That means you have not properly assessed the damage that was done, which is why that report is so is so critical, because it documents. Over the last 150 years, the damage that has been done to African-Americans, and then it makes remedies to repair the damage. All right now. Uh, so I teach that class and then on Saturdays. Uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the class I've been teaching on and off since 2017, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade with a den teacher in school. When we get deep into this history, the thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We do both of these classes live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. You don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time. Uh, the classes are on sale, $80 each. We have a bundle pack where you get both classes for $120. That's a $300 value because there'll be, um, uh, it's a $300 value because we have, uh, you get five of my lectures in the, which will be in the video library. Uh, and you can watch those also. Even after the course is over with, you still have full access. You can go back and watch the entire class. And if you've taken any of my online courses in the past, uh, email me at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com or email me through the website and you'll get a 50% uh, discount on the bundle pack. Okay, so the question comes up sometimes, were there snakes in Ireland? Were there snakes in Ireland? Going back to St. Patrick. Where there snakes in Ireland? Okay. Let's look at this article from National Geographic. And the other articles also. I use National Geographic because I paid them $25 a month for my subscription. I have numerous, I, I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis. And National Geographic is one of them. Washington Post, New York Times, all those. So I have a lot of paid subscriptions. To be able to access this information, to be able to teach, to be, to be able to do what I do. Snakeless in Ireland. Blame Ice Age, not St. Patrick. Snakeless in Ireland. Blame Ice Age, not St. Patrick. One man is credited with taking all snakes out of Ireland, but science tells a different story. 
So this is from August 16th, 2018, National Geographic, written by James Owen. Okay, uh, on St. Patrick's Day, most revelers don't remember the patron saint of Ireland for his role as a snake killer. But legend holds that the Christian missionary rid slithering reptiles from Ireland's shores as he converted its peoples from paganism, from paganism during the fifth century AD. St. Patrick supposedly chased the snakes into the sea after they began attacking him during a 40 day fast, uh, he undertook uh, on top of a hill. An unlikely tale, perhaps, yet Ireland is unusual for its absence of native snakes. Yet Ireland is unusual for its absence of native snakes. It's one of only a handful of places in the world including New Zealand, Green, Iceland, Greenland, and Antarctica, where Indiana Jones and other snake-averse humans can visit without fear. But St. Patrick had nothing to do with uh, Ireland's snake-free status, scientists say. As keeper of natural history at the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, Nigel Monaghan has thwarted Nigel Monaghan has thwarted has trawled I should say through vast collections of fossil and other records of Irish animals quote he said at no time has there ever been any suggestion of snakes in Ireland so there was nothing So there was nothing for St. Patrick to banish. At no time has there ever been any suggestion of snakes in Ireland. So there was nothing for St. Patrick to banish. So what did happen? Most scientists point to the recent, uh, to the most recent ice age, which kept the island too cold for reptiles, which kept the island island too cold for reptiles until it ended 10,000 years ago. After the ice age, surrounding seas may have kept snakes from colonizing the Emerald Isle. Uh, Emerald Isle. All right, uh, read the rest of this article here. Um, yeah, okay, so read the rest of that article from uh, National Geographic snakes in Ireland blame ice age, not St. Patrick. Okay. So there's also a good, uh, article from history.com official website of the history channel, which deals with seven surprising facts about St. Patrick's day, seven surprising facts. Uh, about St. Patrick's Day. I'm just going to look at this briefly because I want to get to some misinformation floating around on social media, uh, which deals with the Twa in um, Ireland. Okay, this right here. So, Seven surprising facts about St. Patrick's Day. Um, let's see. Let's look at this. One, the real St. Patrick was born in Britain. We've talked about that. Not Ireland. Who was the real St. Patrick? Was that, was that legend about the snakes true? And why did so many St. Patrick Day traditions start in America? While St. Patrick's Day is now associated with wearing green parades when they're not canceled and beer, the holiday is grounded in history that dates back more than 1500 years ago. The earliest known celebrations were held in the 17th century on March 17th, marking the anniversary of the death of St. Patrick in the 5th century, right about 462 common era 
Okay, so Patrick uh, was born in Britain, as we said. Also, number two, there were no snakes in Ireland. There were no snakes around for St. Patrick to banish. Number three, the leprechauns are likely based on Celtic fairies. Now, some people say it's based upon the Twa, the Batwa, the Twa, what are the be called pig, pygmies. I want to see more evidence on that. It's possible because we know we know the um the twa go all around the world that is true now patrick killing 200,000 twa which is some nonsense that's in the video floating around there's absolutely no evidence of that the red-haired green clothed leprechaun is commonly associated with saint patrick's day the old the original Irish name for these figures of folklore is uh, Lobersin, L-O-B-A-I-R-C-I-N, meaning small-bodied fellow, small-bodied fellow. Belief in leprechauns likely stems from Celtic belief in fairies, tiny men and women who could use their magical powers to serve good or evil. In Celtic folktales, leprechauns were cranky souls responsible for mending the mending the shoes of other fairies okay then they talk about the shamrock uh was considered a sacred plant and uh patrick used the shamrock a a, a three-leaf clover has been associated with the shamrock a three-leaf clover has been associated with ireland for centuries it was called the semroy s-e a-M-R-O-Y by the Celts and was considered a sacred plant that symbolized the arrival of spring, that symbolized the arrival of spring. According to legend, St. Patrick used the plant as a visual, visual guide when explaining the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which comes from Asar Aset and Heru, the Holy Trinity. By the 17th century, the shamrock had become a symbol of emerging Irish nationalism. Okay, 1700 to 17th century to 1600s. All right, so read um, read the rest of that. That's a history.com. Uh, seven surprising facts about St. Patrick's Day. Okay, now uh, I want to go to this piece here from Snopes.com. And this deals with the St. Patrick wipe out an African pygmy tribe, the first inhabitants of Ireland. So uh, let's see, let's go to this here just a second. Let me pull this article up. All right, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. So here's some information that you can check out and research. You don't have to believe me. You can follow the sources. You can research this. Did St. Patrick wipe out an African pygmy tribe? Uh, the first inhabitants of Ireland. Now we know that, so this is referring to the Twa, okay? We know that the Twa have the oldest DNA on the planet. We know that they uh, circle, go all around the world. They were here in this land also that we call the United States of America. So these, these are the Khoisan, okay? Um, Khoisan are the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. But this deals with memes that are floating around that have popped up in the last few years on social media and this idiotic TikTok video as well, making these assertions backed up by no evidence. 
A longstanding theory of ancient Irish history describes the genocide of the Twa Pygmies, purportedly the original source of the leprechaun myth. So th this was first published in July 29th, 2019, updated March 17th, 2023. Um, so the claim is St. Patrick led the genocide of a contingent of Twa Pygmies from Central Africa who were the original inhabitants of Ireland. Now, the Twa, the Khoisan do go all around the world. And they were here in the U.S. and in and, and Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, documents this. Probably in Ireland also. But um, evidence of Patrick killing thousands of them or in or one claim killed 200,000 Twa or Pygmies. I have no idea where they're getting that information from. I have seen no evidence substantiating anything like that. And they don't even provide the people to put that stuff out and put those means out. Don't even provide any historical sources. In the summer of 2019, we received renewed inquiries from readers about an unusual interpretation of the legacy of St. Patrick. One that claimed the patron saint of Ireland was responsible for the genocide of an African tribe who were purportedly the, orig the original inhabitants of that island. The theory has given rise to many memes and social media posts that in recent years have been sh have been shared widely, especially around March 17th, the feast day of St. Patrick. The memes are often accompanied by images that appear to show white men posing with African pygmies. OK, or Khoisan. A typical version of the of the meme claims Quote, the Patois Pygmies of Ireland, the original inhabitants, the source of the leprechaun legend. When you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, that's the celebration of their genocide. End quote. The theory was neatly summarized by the author and speaker B.F. Nkrumah in a widely shared Facebook video in March 2018. The theory is not backed up by any historical evidence and as a set of factual claims, it can be dismissed. One prominent historian told Snopes it was simply, quote, complete nonsense, end quote. Now, the origins of the Twa theory of Irish prehistory are not entirely clear. However, it appears to be informed by what is sometimes referred to what they call Afrocentrism, an approach to historical study that emphasizes the role and achievements of African people in the evolution of Western civilization. Now, there's scholarly work in what I don't refer to it as Afrocentrism. That was largely um, coined by uh, Dr. Maleficetti Asante, who's a friend of mine. He's the chair of the um, Africana Studies or Afro-American Studies Department at Temple University. What happens is when you have outlandish claims that are being put out like this, usually not by like scholars and historians but just outlandish claims with no with no evidence put out there it gets associated as oh well that's afrocentrism or something like that which harms the overall um genre of african history or what may be called afrocentrism by dr maleficetti asante and other scholars just putting out information with with no sources no historical evidence just putting stuff out there is harmful and it just gets circulated and then people just believe it and it's oftentimes nonsense uh okay so the theory also seems to be influenced by uh your uh uh your 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 e U H E M E R I S M, an unusual strand of pseudo history that has that was particularly popular in the 19th century. So, to give some background information, I'll give you some additional information on the Khoisan. The Twa or Batwa, B A T A, are a people indigenous to the Great Lakes region of Central Africa, and we see them coming 
we see them in Southern Africa also. They are sometimes referred to as Twa pygmies and uh, an anthropological term denoting their relatively short stature. So you see, these are the short statured Africans. Although some exact details are lacking about the life of St. Patrick, it is generally accepted among historians that he lived the century ago. Okay, we've dealt with all that. Um, okay, one of the legends attached to Patrick in the centuries following his death was that he banished the snakes from Ireland. This is not based in fact. No fossil records have shown that snakes were ever indigenous to the island. Uh, uh, to the island of Ireland, and the myth was likely a metaphor for the Christianization and decline in paganism for which Patrick and other early Irish saints are credited. Because there was in the year before Patrick was sent in to Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity, there was another man who the Christian church sent in to convert the Irish. To Christianity. Uh, let's see. The earliest archaeological evidence of human habitation of the island dates back, dates to between 10,640 and 10,860 BC. Those were probably Africans because it wasn't, in, I mean, th there were no Europeans on the earth at that time. Uh, so those were probably Africans, okay, at that time. So the earliest archaeological evidence of human habitation in the island of Ireland dates between 10,640 and 10,860 BC. So that's about 12,000 years ago. Those were probably Africans. Those were probably, those, those were probably, because the Twa go, the, the, the Khoisan, okay, or the Twa go all around the world. No evidence um, exists to show that Twa Pygmy settled uh, the island at any point in history beyond uh, beyond which it makes little sense to imagine that a traditional hunter forager people that emerged from landlocked Central Africa would have had the geographical awareness or technical knowledge to construct and sell ships thousands of miles northwest. OK, now we know that shipbuilding um, Africans were sailing going back. 100,000, 130,000 years ago, okay? Um, so it's quite possible the Twa were there because who else was on the earth 12,000 years ago? You you have African people and they circumnavigated the globe. It's quite possible the Twa were there. Patrick killing 200,000 Twa, I don't know where they're getting that from. I don't. If you have some evidence of that, please send it to me. I don't know. I don't know where they're getting that from. Okay. So I'm not saying the Twa were not there because they circumnavigated the globe, the short statured Africans. Development of the theory. We found several iterations of the Twa theory of Irish prehistory. One version published in 2007 by the website of the Amen Ankh uh, community in Kansas City, Missouri offered the following outline um indigo me melanated people are the original snake-headed people of ireland we are the ones who were driven off etc okay you can read the rest of that uh much of this account is simply incoherent and the only would be evidence put forward for the claim that saint patrick engaged in genocide against the twa is that the knotted hairstyle of twa and ethnic Bantu peoples bear something of a resemblance to snakes. This is a quintessential example of pseudo history, starting off with the requirement of proving the Twa Pygmies were the original inhabitants, not only of the of Ireland but of the whole European continent, and then retrospectively finding any available connections, including links to different cultural tradition uh to the central african twa pygmies etc twa go all around the world all right you can read the rest of this here so it's very possible that the twa were there killing two hundred thousand. i don't have any evidence of that uh 
I don't, if you have some, let me know. Uh, I have seen nothing on that. Now, let's look at information dealing with the Khoisan. And the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet, the short statured Africans, who we see in Southern Africa and Botswana and Namibia. In October 2012, genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The, so if their ancestral line originates 100,000 years ago, that goes far back before 10,000 B.C. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Uh, now, here are a couple of Khoisan women, okay? The Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, the Sans people, and keepers of the livestock, the Khoikhoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. Now, the Khoisan go all around the world. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. African people are not stagnant people. African people migrate and African people circumnavigate the globe. Okay. If we look at, um, where do I want to go? Uh, it's not there. It's, uh, oh, the, the, okay. For instance, just, just look at this here. Let's look at this discovery from um, uh, June 2017 in Morocco. This one right here. We're older than we thought. New evidence, a new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. Now, this article is from NBCnews.com, but all the news outlets had articles dealing with this discovery. Okay, and these, and these are actual slides from my online, my 12-week online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understand the Transatlantic Slave Trade, because we deal with all this in the class. Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought, researchers reported. This article came out June 2017. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago. Modern humans. 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. New discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belonging to modern homo sapiens, modern man, homo sapiens, and uh, uh, belong to modern homo sapiens, and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago. The earliest previous homo sapien bones date back 195,000 years ago. And they're from clear across the continent of Africa in modern day Ethiopia. So th this discovery here pushes the timelines back in their numerous archaeological discoveries that have come out in the last 15 years that continue to push the timelines back. OK, and this is why I say the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. All this is much older than we thought. Africans were circumnavigating the globe. Africans were here going back at least 51,700 years ago. And these were the Khoisan. And this is what Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him 13, time, 13 14 times. And you've seen him here on the uh, African History Network, on the African History Network show. And... Um, I'll show you the cover of his book because uh, we, we use that in the class. Okay. 
his book um, right here, the, the, his first book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. His second book is The First Americans Were Africans, Revised and Expanded. Okay. So uh, the earliest previous Homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago, and they're clear across the continent in modern day Ethiopia. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. Dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. Not only were they dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought, they went around the world much farther back than anyone ever thought. So Dr. David M. Hotep was interviewed on WKRP in Cincinnati Channel 5 in 2011 talking about his book, The First Americans Were, were uh, Africans Documented Evidence. And he talked about a discovery um, on the Greek island of Crete, which dates back uh, 130,000 years ago. Now, this is an article from the New York Times. It's about an archaeological discovery. And the name of this article is On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. This article is from February 15, 2010. And the synopsis of the article, except of the article says, stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete over two summers, archaeologists say, are at least 130,000 years old. Stone tools, at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence of the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Now, you got the discovery in 2017 in, in, in June in Morocco that shows Homo sapiens in Morocco 300,000, 350,000 years ago. And that's 100,000 years before all the archaeologists and, sci and scientists thought Homo sapiens existed, modern man. Here you have evidence of seafaring going back at least 130,000 years ago, much, much earlier than the archaeologists and anthropologists originally thought seafaring took place, especially in the Mediterranean. The article goes on to say Crete has been an island for more than five million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous artifact discoveries had shown people reaching Cyprus a few other Greek islands and possibly Sardinia, okay, um, which is an Italian island in the Mediterranean, Sardinia, no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. See, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. And I've been, I've been studying history 33 years. Um, I've been teaching this class uh since 2017 okay and i've been every other week these new archaeological discoveries come out and it's causing the scientists archaeologists and pa paleontologists etc to keep pushing the timelines back the deeper they dig the blacker the planet gets the more research they do the older we get all right uh, okay, so you can read the rest of this. And they found more than 2,000 stone artifacts, including the hand axes, the stone tools. And this was over the course of two summers on the Greek island of Crete. Okay, so it wasn't like one or two uh, things that they found. No, they found overwhelming evidence. Now, there was a discovery in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, that, uh, made by Dr. Albert Goodyear who's a, uh, an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, Dr. David M. Hotep deals with this on page 14 of his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence 
in the area that today we call South Carolina that dates back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174, the haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. And his book is also backed up by 713 footnotes and seven peer-reviewed articles. Now, there's, a, there's an article that Science Daily Tom did November 18, 2004, to deal with Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. And this is a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear, Dr. Albert Goodyear here. Science Daily, ScienceDaily.com to deal with scientific discoveries and archaeological discoveries, things like this. So you can go read this article. It's still there. New evidence puts man in North America. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. This is from November 18th, 2004. Okay, it's like 19 years ago. Um, and here's a synopsis, here's a summary of what the article says. This is not my summary. This is the summary from ScienceData.com. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Alba Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. So if that's true, then who were those humans? They weren't European. Who were they? Well, the only people on the face of the earth 50,000 years ago were African people. And these were the short statured Africans who we call the Khoisan. Um, the, the um, ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. Okay. So this is a deep history. And there's more archaeological evidence coming out to substantiate this. So I'm not saying the Twa were not in Ireland. A good chance they were. Patrick killing 200,000 or 100,000 or something like I don't I don't know where they're getting that from. I, I, if you got some evidence to substantiate that, please send it to me. I don't, I don't know where they're getting that from. Uh, and then we look at, for instance, like let's, if we look at, say, Africans in Asia, for instance. Um, okay, I'm way over time, but we're going to wrap this up here. If we look at, for instance, um, Africans in Asia. And where is, okay, like right here. And we look at the short statured Africans. Uh, called the Negritos. We see the first inhabitants of uh, Asia were African people. The earliest modern Homo sapiens sapiens populations of Asia were also of African birth. Here we are speaking of the diminutive Africoids, the extremely important and much romanticized family of black people phenotypically characterized by unusually short statures, skin complexions that range from yellowish to dark brown, tightly curled hair, and in, fre and in frequent cases, like many other blacks, uh, stetopegia, stetopegia, which uh, means deposits of fat around the buttocks. They are probably more familiar to us by such pejorative terms as pygmies, negritos, and negrilos. Similar peoples who live today in Southern Africa have been titled Bushmen. More accurate names for these latter people are the San people, translated as original inhabitants, S-A-N, the San people. Moving slowly and sporadically from their African birthplace beginning perhaps 100,000 years ago and continuing through the millennia, untold numbers of diminutive Africoids began to people Asia. Although they currently exist in limited numbers and are, general, and, and are generally found in heavily forested, barren, isolated, or similarly forbidding terrains, the diminutive Africoids 
were at one time the supreme lords of the earth. The diminutive Africoids were at one time the supreme lords of the earth. It is indeed unfortunate that the histories of the diminutive Africoids, including distinct and fundamental contributions to monumental civilizations characterized by agricultural uh, science, metallurgy, uh, dealing working with metals like blacksmith, like being a blacksmith, working with metals, advanced scripts and urbanization are so little understood. Now, this is an article from um, this is part of an article from Renoka Rashidi um, that deals with um, it, it dealt with um, the African uh, before enslavement Africa's ancient diaspora. This is an article he wrote for AtlantaBlackStar.com. And Renoka was a friend of mine. We know he passed away in August 2021. Before enslavement, Africa's ancient diaspora. Okay, so you could check out that article. Um, there's a piece that deals with the original inhabitants of the Philippines. This is an article from face to face africa.com let me pull this up okay also if you like this type of information you want to support the african history network you can do so dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show you can register for the online history classes I teach because I'm going to teach one as soon as I finish here. I'm running behind schedule. We the day uh day Sunday, so we are teaching um black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, US Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. That's a 12 week online course that I teach. Uh let's see here. Let's let's pull up this article here. This is from face to face Africa.com. It's called These Native Africans Were the Original Inhabitants of the Philippines. This is from face to face Africa.com. Where is this? Um, Okay, this article right here. Let's bring this up and close out all these ads to pop up. And we have uh, our cash app and PayPal information around the homepage of our website, also the African History Network.com. These native Africans were the original inhabitants of the Philippines. This is by Farida Dawkins, October 26, 2018, for face-to-faceafrica.com. And you see, you know, if you follow me on the African History Network, our Facebook fan page, which you definitely should, if you don't already do so, you know, we post numerous articles from uh, face-to-faceafrica.com. They have some really good um, articles there. All right, if we look quickly here at this piece, the uh, Aita or Ajda, A-E-T-A, the Aita or Ajda people, uh, Akta people, I should say, A-G-T-A, are the indigenous black-skinned people who inhabit the remote and mountainous regions of uh, Luzon, Philippines. The Aita, um, are under the brackets of Austronesians, groups in Southeast Asia, Oceania, and East Africa that speak languages, that speak languages belonging to the Austronesian language family. Austronesians also reside in South Africa, Suriname, Mauritius, and some portions of the, Ad, uh, of the Andaman. Uh, the Adamant Islands, uh, like the Centralese. The Aita 
are also considered to be Negritos, a name given to them by Spanish conquerors, a name given to them by Spanish conquerors. They have dark brown to extremely dark brown skin, kinky and curly hair, which ranges in dark brown to blonde, small noses, dark brown eyes, and possess short height and possess short height, okay, like the Khoisan or the Twa. They are also called Pugot, uh, P U G O T, or uh, P U G U T, and a uh, Locano term which translates into goblin or forest spirit. Due to, if we look at some history here, due to internal strife within the tribe, this organization and a weak mode of fighting off enemies, the Aita, were sold into slavery in uh, Borneo and China during the 1500s, as documented by Miguel Lopez de um, Legazpi, uh, L-E-G-A-Z-P-I, a Spanish navigator and governor general. Here's some more pictures here. The Aita. Okay, so read the rest of this here. Uh, it says, like other nomadic African tribes, the Aita are adapted using bows and arrows. They have been documented as being excellent warriors who can attack field workers or travelers that wander into their territory. Uh, let's see here. Transformation. Okay. You can read the rest of this uh, article here, face-to-faceafrica.com. But this deals with the original inhabitants of the Philippines who, who are African people as well. All right. So hopefully you learned a lot today. And I know we covered a lot. I want to look at my list here, make sure I covered everything that I wanted to cover. We did that, that, yep. Christmas, pagan. Okay, non valid contributions of civilization. We covered all of that. All right, so follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African His History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Um, you can financially support us as well. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on there because it takes a lot of work on top of everything else that I do. Um, you can support us, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Please register for the online history classes that I teach because I have I, we use two platforms to teach those classes, Crowdcast and Learn World. And I have to pay them each month to be able to, to, to have the class on those platforms. This is not free to do any of this. Um, if you go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, we have the information here for the classes. And you can join me in the class I'm getting ready to teach right now. We're running behind schedule. Uh, my Sunday class, uh, we, we, we were going to start at 2.30, but we're about to start in a couple minutes here. From the uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. So that class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And I'm going to post the link here so you can um, register for the class here. Register for the full course. And if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, also email me at AHN Show at the African History Network.com so you get a 50% discount on the bundle pack of courses. Uh, then Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'af for understanding the transatlantic slave trade. We usually do that 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The African History Network show is on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. on the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. So we're celebrating the 13th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show in general. It started in March, March 10th, 2010. So we're celebrating our 13th anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. And in April of this year, it'll be um, eight years, let me see, it'll be seven, it'll be seven years 
broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF, but we're celebrating the 13th anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. I started March 10th, 2010 on the Harambe Radio Network. Then I went to Blog Talk Radio. We've got our PayPal information here. So in Cash App, the link's here. Um, I, I put this graphic together showing our Cash App tag dollar sign the ahn show because some unscrupulous people have set up fake african history network cash app accounts and they've been stealing money from us so these are two of the fake accounts here there are three at least three other ones that i've seen um i've contacted cash app a number of times they opened up an investigation i don't know what they're doing they're slow as hell um but this is our official cash app tag dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it and say michael these other ones are fake so their tag is like dollar sign the ahn s-h-o dollar sign the ahn s i saw one that had like a gmail account those are all fake this is our cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w and that's why you type in the, the full Type in if you type it in, type in the full a uh, full cash app at, uh, tag, and it'll say Michael, uh, or just click the link here. It makes it easy. Just click the link right here, and this is our PayPal link also. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember the African History Network. We focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Peace. And you can email us if you've taken any of our classes in the past. You can email us AHN show at the African History Network.com for the uh, 50% discount. Also, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K E M E T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter as well. And I have to put that information on our new website, the African History Network.com. All right, we'll talk to you next time. Peace.